All right, so we have learned the four main steps of metabolism as they pertain to glucose. So we go through glycolysis, then pyruvate dehydrogenase chemistry, and then we move on to the citric acid cycle and electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation. So as we learned those four main um, sort of metabolic steps for the metabolism of glucose, we talked about two important branch point metabolites. We talked about pyruvate, which is the end point of glycolysis, but importantly, we talked about acetyl-CoA, which is the entry point for the citric acid cycle. Now, why this is important is because those are going to be branch point metabolites that allow us to have alternative fuels from glucose sort of enter into our metabolic system. So highlighting here, we're gonna be focused on fat metabolism and ketone body production in this video and highlighting that the entry point for here is acetyl-CoA and that is a super important piece because we cannot enter in at pyruvate, which importantly means fats cannot be converted into glucose. Okay. When we talk about protein metabolism, when we talk about amino acids, and we'll get to that in another video, but just to give you that overview here, when we get to amino acid metabolism, amino acids come in two flavors, what we call glucogenic or ketogenic. Glucogenic amino acids can be converted into glucose because their branch point metabolite entry point is pyruvate. Ketogenic amino acids can only be converted into ketone bodies, and that's because their branch point metabolite sort of entry point is acetyl-CoA, okay? So that's sort of an overarching theme as we talk about these other two fuels that we're gonna consider. And remember, we're considering fats here as a fuel because they are a really important source of energy, particularly stored energy in your body. We will talk about the metabolism of amino acids, but I want you to remember that the purpose of protein consumption is not as a fuel for metabolic breakdown, but as a building block, either for other proteins or other sort of amino acid derivatives. All right, so let's step back for a second. And even though I sort of did a lot of talking here with my hands, let's look at this picture and remind ourselves sort of where we've been. Right, I just sort of highlighted, we went through sort of, let me zoom out here so we can see all of this. We went through the four main steps of glucose metabolism. Glycolysis to generate pyruvate, pyruvate dehydrogenase chemistry to generate acetyl-CoA, the citric acid cycle to fully oxidize that acetyl-CoA, and then electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation as a mechanism to deal with all of the alternative chemist or alternative currency that we've sort of generated throughout this process. So what we're going to do now is again highlight how the other fuels that we're thinking about, lipids as a primary fuel entering in at acetyl-CoA, and then in our next video series we'll talk about proteins. Remember the purpose of protein consumption is as a building block, but if you do need to sort of metabolize excess amino acids, they can enter in as either acetyl-CoA or pyruvate, depending on whether they are glucogenic amino acids or ketogenic amino acids. Highlighting here, look at this. We've got lipids, triglycerides. Once we snip off the fatty acids, those are where the bulk of energy is. They enter in at acetyl-CoA. You will notice that lipids say, oh, well, wait a minute, there's something that enters in on pyruvate. We're not gonna be considering this piece, but remember the glycerol backbone is three carbons. That is something that can be converted into pyruvate, but it's a very nominal um, sort of amount of the uh, carbon atoms, if you will, that are in triglycerides that by formalism, we really don't say that fats can be converted into glucose because it's really only the glycerol backbone that's able to do so. All right, so let's take a look at this overview of fat metabolism. And you'll notice here, just like we learned about with glucose, we talk about both the anabolic, uh, I'm sorry, the catabolic or the breakdown arm, as well as the anabolic arm, sort of the synthesis arm. So we're gonna focus largely here over on the right side here. This is the catabolic arm. So this is fatty acid breakdown. And we're doing a process that we'll refer to from now on as beta oxidation. So just like we've done with all of our sort of um, uh, metabolic pathways here, there's a net equation that I want you to know. It's not sort of uh, a balanced chemical equation because we're not going to like, you know, uh, do bookkeeping per se. But I do want you to know that when you start with fatty acids, and you undergo this process called beta oxidation, you generate acetyl-CoA, NADH, and FADH2. 
so acetyl-CoA, and then we're going to have NADH and FADH2. So sort of color coding any metabolites that we have, we're going to highlight in blue here. So again, we've got fatty acids, which are a sponge that's really wet with water. Using that analogy of a sponge with water being a fuel with electrons, okay? We're going to harvest those um, electrons. We're going to harvest that water. We're going to save it as our reduced cofactors. So our reduced cofactors are those B vitamins. So we've got NADH and FADH2. You do not need to know the details of this picture. I will highlight once we get to next semester, this picture is going to be an oversimplification of how we're going to learn fat metabolism. But let's map in where we see these pieces. Okay, Here is, again, the production of NADH. Here is the production of FADH2, our alternative currencies. And it's not specifically labeled here, but this guy down at the bottom is our acetyl-CoA. So here's acetyl-CoA. There's acetyl-CoA there. So I want you to think about, and I don't know if you've ever like seen like those pop beads that we have, you know, for, as a baby toy. That's sort of what it looks like here. Each little bead is a carbon atom. When we metabolize fats, we snip it off two carbon atoms as a time at a time as acetyl-CoA. Okay? So just like we talked about with all of our other metabolic pathways, I want you to know sort of where this occurs and how many steps it is, whether it's aerobic or anaerobic. I will highlight anytime we do something in the mitochondria, we're going to sort of couple, well, that must be an aerobic process. That can be an oversimplification, but for how we're learning this and the level that we're flying at right now with this 30,000 foot view, that's going to be sort of okay. So this happens in the mitochondria. It is a four-step process, okay? And um, again, because we're in the uh, mitochondria, we're going to consider it to be uh, an aerobic process. Let's just take a second here, and we're going to map on then what happens and how it's different when we come over to this other arm here. So this is going to be the fatty acid synthesis arm. Okay? And... I'm not really going to ask you to know too much. There's not a net equation really to think about with this. It really is sort of the reverse of this. But we basically are going to zip together acetyl-CoA, and we're going to make it into fatty acids. And again, we're going to store those. So if we sort of think about what happens here, again, we can write this on here. We're going to have acetyl-CoA. So again, that's our metabolite that we start with. This is the important piece. When we have excess acetyl-CoA, should be a reminder to you that's going to happen when we're in a fed state. Remember, any fuel can be made into acetyl-CoA. Glucose, excess, goes through glycolysis to pyruvate. Pyruvate dehydrogenase converts it into acetyl-CoA. Okay, so importantly, excess glucose means excess acetyl-CoA means we're going to take that and we again are going to synthesize that acetyl-CoA into fatty acids. Those fatty acids are going to be assembled into triglycerides, and those triglycerides are going to be stored in adipose tissue. So any excess fuel, and importantly, excess carbohydrate, will be made into fat. So here's the only other piece that I want you to know about this. This is going to be an important piece when we consider um, sort of regulation of this next semester. This process is cytosolic. So one of the big keys here that we're going to see is we differentiate what we're doing, not only by need state, fed state, by phospho versus dephospho systems, but often where we compartmentalize the enzymes to do the chemistry. In this case, mitochondria means you're doing fatty acid breakdown. Cytosol means you're doing fatty acid synthesis. Okay, so we'll get to those details later. Do you remember when we were learning about the fates of pyruvate and whether we took pyruvate through pyruvate dehydrogenase chemistry? Let's go to that slide just so that we can sort of see that here. When we are looking at the fates of pyruvate, right, what we do with pyruvate largely depends on whether we are under aerobic or anaerobic conditions, right? Oxygen in the room, we can dip into the mitochondria, we can do pyruvate dehydrogenase chemistry anaerobic conditions, you still have to do something with pyruvate and you have to regenerate NAD+. So what do you do? Lactate dehydrogenase and the cytosol can do both of those things. So the fates of pyruvate are largely determined by the aerobic or anaerobic state sort of of your system. OK, 
okay? When we think about where we're sort of at here with fat metabolism, I want us to think about what we do with acetyl-CoA. So we're gonna have another slide a little bit later on that will actually delve a little bit deeper into this. But when we are talking about acetyl-CoA, and I'm gonna be on the beta oxidation arm here, I highlighted over here, if you're in a fed state, you're actually gonna be doing something different with acetyl-CoA. But if we're in a need state, I wanna highlight the difference that can happen in your liver as you generate acetyl-CoA. And so what you can have in the liver, and the liver we're gonna see is one of these organs that allows you to sort of really help the rest of the body. We're gonna call that global assistance or global use. So if we want that acetyl-CoA to help globally, one of the important things we're gonna highlight here is we're gonna talk about things that can be exported, things that cannot. For example, ATP cannot be exported and shared with other cells. Acetyl-CoA cannot be exported and shared with other cells. So oftentimes what you need to do is convert it into something that can be exported and shared. And for acetyl-CoA that is generated in the liver, it can be made into ketone bodies. Ketone bodies can be exported, ketone bodies being an important metabolite here. Ketone bodies can be exported, so they can be shared with other cells. And so in this way, the liver can synthesize ketone bodies, export them to the bloodstream, and help with a global need state. Now, it may just be that, you know, the liver needs its own energy. So you can actually have that acetyl-CoA be used locally. And that local use means that you are going to take and use that acetyl-CoA in the citric acid cycle, fully oxidize, do this, do this chemistry, fully oxidize this into CO2, and then more of that, uh, those reduced cofactors that we can eventually cash in in the electron transport chain with oxidative phosphorylation. All right, so that's sort of the fat metabolism piece, thinking about fatty acid breakdown in the mitochondria, generating acetyl-CoA, which can have a couple of different fates, or if you've got excess acetyl-CoA, fatty acid synthesis is going to synthesize in those into fatty acids, assemble them into triglycerides, and store them in adipose tissue. One of the pieces we'll also map on next year when we sort of take a deeper dive on this is the role that insulin plays in sort of helping to regulate that process, right? And that's sort of tapping into this need state, fed state. So let's continue because it's related to fat metabolism here. Another slide here to think about ketone body production. So when we think about ketone body production, right? We need to think about where this can occur and we're gonna focus right now ketone body production is going to occur in the liver. That's because you can sort of help with that global need. So what we're gonna have is we're gonna have fatty acids that we're going to break down by beta oxidation and generate acetyl-CoA. So the importance again of ketone bodies is ketone bodies are a um, water-soluble, circulating fuel. So if we think about what we know about uh, ketone bodies, right, these are a fat derived but hydrophilic circulating fuel. So the importance of hydrophilic circulating fuels, right, they can go anywhere they want in the body, they don't have transport issues, right, glucose is a really important one, but not only do we not want glucose concentration to be too high, but we have to think about whether or not there's you know, sufficient glucose that's around. And if you've not eaten in a while, we'll talk about sort of the fasted state. If you've not eaten in a while, your glycogen reserves are depleted. Um, you can be making glucose through gluconeogenesis, but you're gonna have to supplement food and fuel in another way because you have to have these endogenous stores. Uh, stores. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna break down fats from your triglycerides, you're gonna generate acetyl-CoA, and then here's the ketone body sort of uh, production. So ketone bodies, again, fat-derived, hydrophilic, uh, circulating fuel, um, reminding ourselves, and I said this on the other slide, but we'll put it in here, highlighting that acetyl-CoA cannot be exported. So if you want to essentially disguise acetyl-CoA so that you can get it into other cells, what you're gonna do is you're gonna put two acetyl-CoAs together. Two carbons plus two carbons is gonna give us the four carbon acetoacetate. 
We'll go some, through some of this biochemistry next semester, but notice again, this is a reversible process. The liver can assemble the acetyl-CoAs together to make acetoacetate, circulate that to other tissues. They can disassemble them, get back to that acetyl-CoA, and now they've got a starting point for energy generation by taking that acetyl-CoA into the citric acid cycle. Okay, so mapping on some things that we just talked about, these are two C2 pieces, we assemble them into a four carbon acetoacetate. Again, that is important because this can be exported. So an important hydrophilic circulating fuel that's derived from a very ample storage reserve, right? We've got lots of uh, energy stored in adipose tissue. We sort of highlighted that even somebody who sort of, um, you know, has a normal amount of fat distribution in their body probably has two months or so of energy that's stored in that adipose tissue. So I really like this slide here and this um, sort of uh, distinction between the three different substances that we call ketone bodies because it allows us to easily see ones that are related by the same number of carbon atoms in oxidized and reduced forms. Hopefully you can look at these species and recognize that this is the oxidized form because if we look at what's different between these two species, we've got a ketone and we've got a um, alcohol. So we've got, in this case, the um, uh, oxidized and reduced forms of the same species, so acetoacetate and then beta-hydroxybutyrate. Notice what is important here. Think about what's happening when we are making ketone bodies. We are likely in a need state. Let's sort of put this up here. We didn't really sort of highlight uh, when we're going to be doing ketone body production. You're not going to be making ketone bodies when you're in a fed state. This is 100% a need state sort of uh, pathway. And so just reminding ourselves that is going to be sort of a phospho system. And remember, when we are in a need state, we're likely to be in a catabolic sort of um, system. We want to be breaking down things. What do we need for that? We need NAD+. So look at this. This is a beautiful way to, you know, sort of maybe generate the NAD+, that we need. Remember, we if we want to have continued catabolism, we need to have NAD+. So continued catabolism. That can be uh, facilitated by generating an additional NAD+. Okay, so we've got two ketone bodies here. We can export these. Then once they get to their final destination, they can be disassembled. We can get that acetyl-CoA back, and we've got an entry point into the citric acid cycle to ultimately generate that cellular energy that that cell is going to need. So I want to take a second here and highlight that you can't have too much of a good thing. Excess ketone bodies is problematic because that can cause a drop in your blood pH, right? Putting you in, I want it red here, putting you in sort of a state of um, ketoacidosis. So this is ketoacidosis. That can be life-threatening, okay? So what your body does anytime there is something in excess is it tries to find ways to get it out, right? Can you pee it out? Can you poop it out? Can you sweat it out? Can you breathe it out, okay? Notice the relationship between acetoacetate and acetone, decarboxylation chemistry. Ooh, we're gonna learn a lot more about this later on, but this is what we call a beta keto acid. Acetoacetate is a beta keto acid. Anytime you have a carboxylic acid, carboxylic acids can easily decarboxylate. So I'm going to highlight this in purple here. This is where that CO2 group comes from. Anytime you have a carboxylic acid, you can decarboxylate that metabolite and you can eliminate CO2. It happens much more easily when you have a beta keto acid Let's look at the mechanism for this. Look at this. All right, we've got these electrons here. Those electrons are going to go down there. They're going to form a pi bond. Remember what the structure of CO2 looks like. Here's CO2. But if I do this chemistry and I generate that pi bond, I can't have five bonds to carbon. I'm going to break this bond. Now, putting that lone pair of electrons on this carbon atom 
is okay because I can resonance stabilize them. Let's imagine we've got these. I can resonance stabilize them through that oxygen. So that's why beta keto acids readily decarboxylate. So anyways, back to our story here. Beta keto acids readily decarboxylate. We generate acetone. Why that's important is you can exhale that. This is a way to get rid of excess ketone bodies. Now, there's lots of ways that you can also get rid of excess ketone bodies. You will see high levels of ketone bodies in your urine, right? So there's lots of ways that your body will try to rid itself of excess toxic substances, but this is a key one for somebody who's in ketoacidosis. You will notice that they have a sweet smell to their breath, and that's because they are exhaling lots of acetone, okay? Um, we'll talk about this in a little bit more on our protein metabolism 30,000 foot view, but you can put yourself into what we call a state of nutritional ketosis, okay? That's where maybe you are fasted a little bit, you're not consuming carbohydrates as much, so you need to be tapping into this process to generate this hydrophilic circulating fuel, okay? So when you are in a state of nutritional ketosis, right, you don't have high carbohydrate consumption, you're probably doing gluconeogenesis to make sure that you don't have a life-threatening drop in your blood glucose, but the majority of your fuel is going to be derived from your adipose tissue generating ketone bodies. But again, because of what's sort of going on here, you're not having excessive levels of ketone body production, okay? Stepping back just for a second and um, highlighting, well, why is this a problem? Like, why would this be so problematic with diabetics? Why would diabetics get into a state of diabetic ketoacidosis? So let's remember what's happening with somebody who's diabetic, right? They are either not producing insulin or not listening to insulin. Type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, right? Regardless, they're going to have elevated levels of glucose in their bloodstream, okay? We are unable to get that glucose into their cells because again, they're either not producing insulin or not listening to the signal, particularly muscle cells. You really have to have that, that insulin signal work so that you have those GLUT4 transporters go to the surface and pull in that glucose. Okay, so what's happening on the inside of the cell? Starving, starving, starving. What's on the outside of the cell? Tons of glucose, but we cannot get the food to where it needs to go. So these cells that are starving are putting out starvation signals. This whole idea of like signals saying you are in a need state, phospho system, phospho system. So what's happening is your body's trying to respond. It's saying, hey, all right, let's tap into and break down our fats. Uh, let's make these ketone bodies because we're starving. Okay. We make tons and tons and tons of ketone bodies, but because we're still not getting ample glucose into our cells, our cells still think they're starving. So we never shut off this starvation signal. So we are continuing to pr produce more and more ketone bodies, right? And so that's what you're going to see uh, in two cases. You're going to see that with a diabetic that is not able to produce or respond to insulin. But you're also going to see that in somebody who's undergoing weight loss, because think about what weight loss is going to mean. Weight loss means you are tapping into your fats and you're break breaking them down. Well, part of what you're going to see is some of that fat breakdown in your liver is going to be put out as ketone bodies. So a very normal thing to see undergoing weight loss that when you're metabolizing that um, those uh, triglycerides that are in your adipose tissue, some of it's going to get produced into ketone bodies. And so you will see an elevation in your ketone body production. Wow. I know that was a lot there. Maybe could have been two separate slides, but they're connected. So talking about fat metabolism and then ketone body production.